In theory. You don't need slides. <laughs> You're right, I don't. <laughs> Over the speakers. Um, you have to push the button to make yourself green. And now you're live. Perfect. All right. So um, I did a dry run of the stock probably about 45 minutes ago, uh, and my biggest, my two biggest um, feedback points were that I need to say uh or um less, and I needed to be uh, less monotone. So I apologize. Preemptively, if um, this this talk is anything like either of those, uh, because Elixir is not monotone. Elixir is actually really exciting, and uh, so I'm gonna do my best to convey that. Uh, I was recently hired by House Happy in Northeast. Uh, they, thank you, thank you. It is my first full time position. Uh, and they are, you, they have been using Phoenix and Elixir uh, in production for a couple of years now. Uh, and so I, this is kind of a talk about the first 300 hours of my employment there and my experience using Elixir. So that's my face. Um, <laughs> this is actually mirrored. I don't have speaker's notes. Just give me one sec here. Just give me one sec. Um, we'll do it live. <laughs> You're cool, man. Uh, so my name is Andrew. I am uh, from Malala. Malala is a small town, about 6,000 people, 45 minutes south and east of here. Um, what got me into programming was, I was, very, I mean, I was enticed initially uh, by the idea of freedom. I'm like, hiking along the Pacific Crest Trail and thinking to myself, how do I make this something that's more sustainable than um, you know, having a retail job, which is what I did previously. Uh, and programming really caught my eye because you can, you know, it, it's, it's fairly in demand and, and you can generally kind of, you can go one of two ways about it. You can work for somebody else, you can work for yourself, you can do consulting, and that's kind of what got me excited about it. Um, I started my education at Epicotus. Uh, I worked, I started with the, their intro course and then moved into the Ruby on Rails and JavaScript course. Um, after I finished my uh, time there in May of 2016, I self studied using study groups and uh, Udemy courses, and um, didn't really practice this about presenter's notes. <laughs> Maybe you guys can just speak behind the curtain. Uh, yeah, Udemy courses. We studied all kinds of things, um, from anywhere from like solidity to um, Flavor the month JavaScript and anything, anything in between. Um, at House Happy, we are a service that collects home data and maps it onto a, our own um, software that will kind of help you to handle the maintenance of your home items and, and the home itself, as well as uh, help to manage the projects that the maintenance would um, then require. Uh, and we have a 
set of contractors that are pre-vetted um, that will, you know, makes, it kind of makes your process easier. Kind of makes it easier because I hear that uh, tracking down contractors is the worst part about any project. Um, I'm also uh, really into open source. Uh, currently working with uh, Hacker Rigan on the neighborhoods team. Uh, we partner with the city of Portland, try and tell stories about uh, Portland itself uh, using data. So, uh, you can't really get into Elixir without talking about the history of Elixir, and the history of Elixir is born in Erlang. Um, Erlang, or Ericsson language, was developed uh, by a telecom company called Ericsson uh, out of Sweden uh, by a man named Joe Ar Armstrong. Uh, it is a Concurrent language, concurrency is at its core, mean, meaning that it can also leverage all of the cores um, that are available to the, the program, and it's highly fault tolerant. So uh, the idea was, because it, it is a telecom company, that you can't just shut down the telecom service to update the platform. You know, that, that obviously has to be, um, that has to happen uh, simultaneously. It is a class of language called the uh, nine nines, and that means that uh, there are instances of Erlang that have 99.9 uh, times um, uptime, so a pretty significant amount of uptime over a, a long period of time. It was released in 1998 under an augmented Mozilla license, so open source, um, and I wouldn't be up here today if that hadn't happened. Uh, it is built on the Beam VM, which is one of the oldest virtual machines in the world. Uh, it was built in 1992, where the Java VM is built in 94, and the C Sharp VM is built in 2000. Some companies that are using Facebook, <laughs> some companies that are using Erlang is Facebook uh, in their messenger service, which handles 100 million uh, active users. You have Amazon in their simple DB service. Uh, Yahoo with a social bookmarking service called Delicious, 5 million users, 150 million bookmarks. Uh, T-Mobile actually leverages it for their SMS service and uh, quite a few others actually. The open telecom protocol that um, the framework, it kind of implements this uh, actor model uh, and it's, it's really interesting. The way that it works is they, um, similar to what we have in object-oriented languages, uh, an object will receive a message or a method call, and it does something depending on which message it receives. Uh, and the actor is basically just a recursive function that's passing state back into itself. Um, the actor is something that, they, they all have mailboxes and they speak to one another through these messages and the mailboxes kind of hold the queue. And they, each actor is like an independent process on the OTP. Um, and if any of them were to die, uh, it, Erlang kind of implements this uh, let it crash philosophy, which isn't worried about the fact that it is dying, but is worried about allowing it to die, logging the fact that it dies, and getting it spun back up. Um, and the reason why it is so good about this philosophy is because it, uh, all, of these, all of these processes that are simultaneous and concurrent are entirely isolated. And so if your request lives inside of one of them and that process dies, it doesn't take down, uh, up, you know, the, the whole, like other people's processes or other people's requests. Um, where in, in Java, um, say, if your request were to cause a process to crash, that process may have been handling a pool of requests, and all of those requests would go down along with uh, yours. So the juxtaposition there is really interesting. Um, there's actually a really cool quote from Joe Armstrong. It is uh, one way to highlight the difference between beam languages and other languages is that we 
don't have web servers that handle 20 million sessions, we have 20 million web servers that handle a single session or, or single sessions. Um, WhatsApp is a really interesting case study. <coughs> Uh, there's my excited note. I was trying to remind myself to not be monotonous. Uh, so these statistics are from the date of purchase. Uh, WhatsApp employed 32 engineers. There were eight on the back end. It supported 450 million users um, and had minimal hardware. Uh, and the, the it, the reason they were able to do this was because they leveraged Erlang. Erlang is literally built to, to handle these kinds of systems. Um, and they were purchased by Facebook for $19 billion. Small sum. Uh, Elixir was created in 2011 by Jose Valim uh, from Platform Attack, which you all might be familiar with. They brought us Devise in simple form. Um, it was created out of a need for a better solution than what Rails and, and the Ruby ecosystem offered for multi-core systems. Uh, so it's a superset of Erlang. It compiles to bytecode that runs on the VM. It's uh, interoperable with Erlang, so all of the libraries that Erlang has, that have been created in the Erlang ecosystem, are, can be leveraged by Elixir. Um, and some companies that are notable that leverage or, or use Elixir are Discord, um, all of its servers are written in Elixir, Pinterest uh, and their notification system with 150 million monthly users. Uh, they actually reported a tenfold drop in code, code base size when they migrated over to Elixir while reducing server requirements by half as well. Um, and then Square Enix, which is uh, a game company and they use it for their internal CMS and communicating with APIs. Another really interesting feature about Elixir is the uh, NERVS project. The NERVS project is a framework for programming embedded Elixir, uh, embedded, embedded systems uh, running Linux using Elixir. And um, some of the really interesting features about the language are the standard library is pretty large. Um, you have like all the data types which have functions that are just built right into the language that kind of support a lot of what you would need to do all the trans data transformations and things like that. Um, the, since 1.6, there's a programmable formatter that you are able to run to format your code. There is a testing framework called XUnit, um, pattern matching which is borrowed from other functional languages, if any of you know. Uh, functional, you probably are aware of pattern matching, and then uh, the pipe operator, which is kind of its own flavor, um, and we'll get to that in just a second. So, what is functional programming, and how does it compare to object oriented? Well, um, functional programming is just data, data structures, and functions. Uh, data is immutable and it doesn't share state. So in object-oriented programming, you have uh, instances of you know, objects that have st they're stateful and there is code associated with them that mutates that state. And in functional programming, there's no concept of that. It is all just uh, data structures and uh, the code that, or the functions that operate on those data structures. Um, here's a, I'll make that a little bit bigger. So this is a slide that kind of highlights the um, similarities between Ruby and Elixir on the command line. Um, Elixir does draw a lot of its inspiration from Ruby, so there is quite a bit of crossover. Um, you have IRB, which is the, uh, its equivalent is the interactive Elixir shell, or IEX. Um, you have the mix service, which handles rake and bundler, um, and that's built into the language. You have pry, which is also built into the language. Uh, 
meta programming and macros. Macros, it's actually very easy to do meta programming in Elixir. Uh, a really good example would be the database layer called Ecto uh, that is programmed in Elixir. And then obviously uh, Rails and Phoenix. So this is a case study on uh, an experiment that was kind of run between some developers and, uh, and some of the core member teams, or core, core members of the Elixir team. Uh, so it was started on October 19th of 2015. Uh, a few developers basically just set out to figure out how many concurrent web connections uh, they could set up to Phoenix. And they started out with 1,000 and, and felt that that was suspiciously slow. Um, it turned out that they were limited by a setting called U-Limit that was set to 1K. So they raised it to 2 million just to get it out of the way. Uh, they were posting these stats onto an IRC channel and Chris McCord picked it up and was intrigued. Uh, he got in contact with Rackspace and they were donating free servers. The first real benchmark was at 27,000 connections. You can see that the, the purple line here is users and the green line is connected users. Uh, users increased based on an arrival rate, which was an average of 1,000 per second. Um, Jose was uh, let know that this was happening. He made a single commit and this raised the connections from a thousand to uh, here, actually, 30,000. Uh, Erlang sh ships with an, an observer, and this is an interface that remotely allows you to kind of check on each process that's being spun up and, and, and that's working with your server. Uh, checking the observer, they were realizing that there was a backlog of messages that were kind of queued up against uh, some of these processes. Uh, they realized that this was because Phoenix was doing a pulse check to ensure that the client was still connected about every 30 seconds. Uh, they also realized that this was redundant because it was already handled in Cowboy. And so they uh, made another commit and got up to 100,000 connections. Uh, this drop-off here was because the supervisor was killed uh, during taking of the, the metrics. Uh, the next performance gain was added by, or, or made by adding uh, five more boxes with another 300,000 potential connections. And that uh, is highlighted here. You can see Chris McCord uh, made, a, made a tweet pretty excited about the fact that they've gotten it in four days to 330,000 clients connected to a single server. Um, this was kind of an interesting thing. They wound up uh, changing their ETS table type from bag to duplicate bag, and this allowed them to go from their last game all the way up to 450,000 clients. Um, which is pretty significant, and it just continued kind of going up from there. They uh, Live Help now reached out and was interested in setting up an additional 45 servers to push connections into their um, web socket. They did that, and with uh, a single 128 gigabyte machine from Rackspace, where they were hosting the server, a million connections was achieved. They topped out at the two million clients that they set by new limit, which was uh, pretty interesting to see. Um, I actually was reading about a Discord article prior to uh, coming on today that where it highlighted that Discord was able to get five million concurrent WebSocket connections online on a single server. Um, so when not limited by new limit, just limited by effort. This was a really exciting quote from Joe Armstrong. He said it didn't take long, but pretty soon my gut feeling kicked in. This is good shit. Um, Joe Armstrong being the, the creator of Erlang. And 
if you wanted to learn more, uh, this is where you go. Dave Thomas, who wrote the Ruby Pickaxe book, wrote uh, Programming Elixir. It's about a third of the size. He didn't basically go into like the standard library and all of that, but um, gives a really good overview. Uh, the Elixir Lang .com, uh, exor exorcism actually .io. They have 90 exercises. Uh, Elixir Lang Slack, which is uh, the community Slack channel, and then the Elixir School, which basically has like code alongs and tutorials on anything from very basic to uh, some of the more advanced concepts like concurrent programming. Um, And I just want to show this off real quick. This is basically an application that is written in just, just Elixir. It's, it's not a Phoenix app, but uh, it has two modules. It has the Identicon module, and it has the image uh, struct module. Um, what a struct is, is it's just a, it's a data structure. It has these attributes on the structure that uh, are set to initial values, so we have initial values of nil on each of them, and then as, this is I think a, a really good example of the pipe operator, you basically run this singular function and pass it a uh, parameter, and then down here you reference that parameter and pass it into each one of these functions, mutating it along the way, uh, or I guess transforming it along the way. Uh, what the pipe operator does is it takes this and pipes it in as the first argument to this function, uh, and then the return from hash input will then be piped into pick color and so on. Um, so we can see that, uh, like down here, for hash input, we um, take the input and we match the hex variable on the output of this crypto hash function, passing in. What's that? The bot. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, thank you. Sweet, yeah. Um, so down here, you can see that you have, you're grabbing your parameter, or you, you have your parameter, you're matching this hex variable on the output of this crypto hash um, function, passing, it in, passing the input into it, and then piping the output of this function into this binary.bin to list. Both of these are um, native Erlang libraries, so uh, this is kind of an example of leveraging Erlang libraries to make, uh, to <coughs> use in your code. Uh, and then you can see down here that we're just returning the Identicon image struct, replacing the hex nil value with the return that we matched um, on this value here. And that's kind of the, the way that this all kind of pipes all the way through here, is you just continue to uh, return the Identicon image with more of the attributes um, filled with their values. Uh, here's actually what this does. So it generates an identicon uh, based on whatever string you put into it. So, does anybody have a string they want to try out? PDX Ruby. PDX RB. Let's give it a shot.
Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> what was that? The color is wrong. It's supposed to be red. I don't know. It looks like frog to me. It does kind of look like frog. So I felt like this was a pretty kind of a fun application that showed off some of the more um, just elixir syntax um, very briefly. And that basically wraps it up.